esteemed faculty members in the room today. There are many that were humble and not um, necessarily giving the full context of their global reputations. Um, but today we are talking about a law firm that does have a strong global reputation, and that's one of the reasons we brought them to you here, to expand upon the resources we have in the Midwest and to give you another perspective. Um, as you just heard from Alia, Cooley was is long-standing, worked with startup companies. It was founded in San Francisco in 1920. It's headquartered in Palo Alto. And although they have offices all over the world, they have recently established the Chicago office with an emphasis on the Midwest. And the University of Illinois is one of the institutions they'd like to work with as part of that growth. Because of the innovation coming out of our university and across the Midwest, they saw an opportunity to serve more. The firm's practicing includes corporate litigation, IP, fund formation, public markets, employment, life sciences, and a variety of other areas of work. But they're really known, I think, in the venture capital world as one of the leading uh, firms uh, that works in this specific area of helping startup companies, venture deals, IPOs. So hopefully you'll learn from their experiences today, especially as they talk about financing. But one of the reasons they're here is because of Alia, who already introduced herself to you. Um, but I have known Alia for a long time. and so. It was exciting when she um, continued to help us in this manner, but also uh, to see her evolve. She has worked with us first in the context of being managing director at the Illinois Science and Tech Coalition, which I probably serve on the chair of the board today still. Um, but then next, she was uh, the executive director of Chicago Next World Business Chicago. And then she was COO, the acting CEO of Intersect Illinois, which was the business development arm of the state of Illinois. And now she's vice president at Cooley, helping to represent their new Chicago office. So just a little bit of context of not strangers here with you today from Chicago, but relationships that we've been building. And yet we also recognize that we have um, many local law firms, including Singleton Law Firm, that have helped. But we are also wanting to show you options and expertise across the region that exists. So with that, maybe Lori will introduce herself as one of the attorneys that we've gotten to know as we've been building the relationship. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for coming out. I um, appreciate the really warm welcome and you, you all coming out today to, to see us. Um, uh, as Laura mentioned, um, I'm a partner in the Chicago office of Cooley, which uh, is, uh, I think, more well known as a Silicon Valley law firm first 50 years of its life, that was really where it was focused. Um, but over the last 50 or so years has really been expanding. And so Chicago being uh, the very newest office, I was the one of the founding partners there. I had been practicing for about 15 years at a different law firm um, in Chicago. And when Cooley called and said they were looking at opening an office, um, given what I do, which is working with venture firms and startup companies, it was really kind of a no-brainer decision because it was doing exactly what I had been trying to do on a smaller scale, which is say, look, there's so much innovation, talent, good ideas coming out of the Midwest. You don't have to be in Silicon Valley to have a good idea and commercialize it. When I was first starting out, I had a, a partner who was one of my mentors. I introduced him to a company in Chicago, and I set up this phone call, and, and he gets on the phone, he says, well, if you want to get investment, you got to go out to the barrier. No one's going to invest in you. And I about fell out of my chair because I said, how can that be true? That cannot be true. And, and sort of ever since then, um, it, it's been really important to me to focus on, one, understanding what those markets are. Those are huge markets. They're important. There's great investors. But also to work with companies that are located here. There's a lot of, there's a huge pools of capital here. There are great universities here like University of Illinois. And so that was really the thesis around Cooley opening in Chicago, which was not to say we have to make it like California, but there are things hopefully on the platform and the expertise and the connections that we can bring. But working with people who are from here, I grew up in Minnesota, and so it's, it's, it's just a very important thing that, um, and that's how a lot, a lot of us are thinking. And so we're all, there's Alia over there. She, she's also been just a huge, um, player in our growth and helping us even make more connections throughout the Midwest as we try um, and bring our expertise and hopefully add a little bit of value um, to the current um, ecosystem. So maybe with that, I know you're all here not to learn about Cooley so much, but to hear about some perspectives on fundraising, um, which is what we do and which is what I focus on. Um, again, here's just a little slide about us, but you know, our, our thesis is really, you know, we're in Chicago, but um, have a focus really on the larger Midwest. 
we work with tons of companies all over uh, the, the country and the world and, and also Midwest, some, some leading Midwest clients. Um, but today's topics, I think an, <clears throat> an early iteration of our structure said that there were five uh, topics, so I try to put this into five things that I think you can think about more broadly if you're going to want to raise money. And this is really uh, meant for thinking early stage, and so if some of this stuff are things you already know, or if you have questions, I don't really want to stand here and talk for just me, so please feel free to raise, raise your hand if you have questions or if the things you don't understand. I'd, I'd be, be glad to make this as useful as possible. Um, but you know, one of the very first things that comes up when we talk is if you don't have a company yet, what kind of company do I pick? What structure do I pick? Do I pick an LLC? Do I pick a corporation? You know, there and that that can be actually a really tricky question. Um, the next one is just getting ready. So, what type of diligence did you expect? What do you think the process? What's the process going to look like if I've not done this before? Um, I'll talk briefly about the different types of financings, um, especially for early stages. There's probably you've heard safes and convertible notes versus a price round, and how do they differ? Um, what are the pros and cons? So I'll go through that quickly. Um, the next one is a little more in the weeds, which is valuation. So if you hear someone say, oh, I got a pre-money valuation of $10 million, like what does that actually mean? How do you how do you deal with a term sheet that includes a valuation in it? Is it pre, and, and like and VCs are very facile in this, so they'll talk to you about pre or post and ownership percentages, and, and if you've not done it before, you can find, I think we've seen, we've seen founders sort of end up speaking a different language and it can lead to confusion. Um, so there, there's a little bit of Excel in there, which is about the extent of my math. I know I'm surrounded by people who are great at math, but just in terms of how it really can impact your ownership of the company, and there are certain things that you should not gloss over, which is what I'm hoping we can take away from that. Um, and then just some other key terms that you might see in, in term sheets if, if you get a term sheet from an investor. Um, so it's kind of a, it's a big agenda, but I'll try and move quickly, quickly through it. Um, so the first one, yeah, I titled it Getting Ready. So if you have an idea and you're saying, look, I, I know I want to commercialize this thing, what do I do? The, you know, the basic idea is, number one, you can't own it personally. Um, you can't raise money. People are not going to give it to you personally, so you have to form a company. One that also shields you and your personal assets from liability, so you're taking a risk, but you're not putting your home and things like that on the line. So you, you, know, you definitely do have to form a company. And then you haven't made your decision yet to say, okay, I'm going to form a company. It's like, what type of company should I um, should I form, and which state should I form it in? Um, so the easiest example is probably an Illinois LLC. That's the lowest lift, um, and can be the cheapest from the perspective of filing fees. And I'm located in Illinois, and so I only need to um, I don't have to qualify anywhere else. Um, if you're going to raise money, um, there's also tax considerations, pass-through taxes and things like that that people prioritize when they think about forming an LLC. Um, so we have, there are a lot of companies that, that start as an LLC. Um, if you're going to raise a lot of money from venture and you want to have the easiest and smoothest path to doing so, forming a Delaware corporation is by far the most common type of entity that is selected by companies that raise venture capital throughout the country. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that, but the two primary ones, one of them is just that the industry has gone that way, so there's a standard set of documents. There's the courts in Delaware are very familiar with corporate law issues and you don't end up with sort of judges that don't do this on a day-to-day -day basis what they do, so there's predictability that goes with um, going in Delaware. One, one thing that sometimes people don't really realize is that some funds cannot invest in pass-through companies. So if some of the bigger funds, unless they really, really have an interest in investing in your technology, will say it. they will put it in their term sheet that we will only invest in you if you are a Delaware corporation, which means you must convert before we will invest. Some of our, some even some of the angel funds have that in their form term sheets. So it's not to say you have to, but if you're looking ahead, and that's usually what I ask people, I'm like, what's your, how far away are you from raising? And if the benefits of an LLC are worth it to you, 
you can keep it there and convert later. But that's like that's not a mini decision, <laughs> I would say. It's a it's a decision that you should spend some time on. Talk to your tax advisors. So like, like there's a fair amount that goes into it, and so sort of learning what uh, what the pros and cons of it are are, are important. Um, I mean, for ease of this presentation, all this assumes a Delaware corporation. You can do safes into an LLC, but there's lots of reasons why that's not a good idea. Um, so that's just one. Again, it, in we haven't covered it all, but it's just something that you should definitely keep in mind. The second one, I would say, is you think about founder equity. Um, when I, once I wrote an article that, you know, somebody was asking, what, here's an opportunity to write an article about something in fundraising, and I thought about, like, what's, what should I write? And this is what I wrote about, like, one of the, the first bullet points was how to think about founder equity. Um, who owns the company? Do you have co-founders? Have you agreed with your co-founders the ownership percentages that you own the company in? Have you documented it? Um, all those things may seem simple, but they're not. <laughs> and so what can happen, and we have, I've had this happen in lots of clients, where people don't come to an agreement that they've documented and they end up with a fight over somebody who's separated and they have three people and they're really, really all in it together until somebody has to move because their spouse has something and they're like, well, no, I don't have to of the company. And the two that stay behind say, well, no, I don't, that's not fair, it's going to hurt us. But you haven't had the conversations that you had not dealt with ahead of time. So it's much easier to decide what you think is fair and right and what the right percentage is and think about the go-forward plan. To do it at the beginning when everybody's happy because it's not always that there's a bad actor that a founder becomes separated. They, life happens, right? And so getting an understanding with your co-founders, if you have one, about what the right percentages are and what the expectations are going forward are really just kind of common sense um, discussions to have. But when we start working with new companies, we, we talk about that because obviously you have to have your company in the right structure. And then I tell them, come back to me when you can fill out this questionnaire that has your percentages and your titles and, your <laughs> and how you want to think about vesting. And if that means you have to have some discussions, you should have them. Um, and ask me questions, but like those are just really important things to do up front. Um, the third one, intellectual property. Um, I know this group. I'll understand the importance of that. That's what companies are built around. So um, the idea there is that, like I said at the beginning, you can't personally own the intellectual property. Also, if the university owns the intellectual property, there's probably going to be a license to your company. Right? And so figuring out what your intellectual property is, how it's owned, is it protected, has it been contributed to the company appropriately, all of those things are going to be important. Um, that's, that could be a whole <coughs> series of discussions, so I would just say that that's, that's um, something that you need to have squared away. So that, that's sort of point number one at like high level when you think about launching your company. If you want to get funded, those are things that you should have thought about. One, because they're important to the company's ability to be successful, but two, diligence. If I, when I represent investors, some of the highest level investors, when they say, okay, even when they do a safe round, right, they have a little list of things they look at. Those three things are the things they look at. If they're not gonna look at anything else, we'll say, okay, what should we look at high level red flags? Like, do they have anything terrible? Or, you know, just come, like, look at their information documents. Do we understand where all the founder equity came from? And How's their IP owned? So, like, if you want to think about what's important to investors, it's what's important also to the foundation of the company, and you should expect that, it, at a minimum, those are probably the things that they're going to look at from the, the business side. Now, obviously, there's if you have contracts or if you have other things, they're going to look at those. But at a minimum, those are like the health check that people will look at. Um, pro forma cap table. We'll get to that later, but that's something important that um, investors are going to want to understand. Obviously, which basically tells them how much of the company am I going to own for the amount of money I'm going to give you. Maybe that's um, in a price round you will know that, but in a in a safe round or note you won't know that yet. But just having thought about that and then the potential issues. That's the other thing. Just like red flags, which can be who knows, you know. Um, but if you have anything like that, understanding what a red flag might be and being able to explain it because it will probably come up um, later, so dealing with it sooner. Um, so those are just kind of the, like I say, getting ready things. 
Um, there's a whole host of things that you know, you're know you also doing when you're trying to get your company launched, but from a legal perspective, these are, these are where we focused um, at the beginning. And if there's any questions on that, but if not, I'll just move on um, to the next. So, and this may be more along the lines of what um, will be useful for this group. So if there's any questions, let me know. But generally speaking, um, the first money into a company especially, and this is an area where maybe it's a little different in the Midwest than it is in the Bay Area, where at least at a certain time people could just raise a Series A with $10 million and not take any seed financing and it was just great. Like that's not the norm. The norm is usually people raise on um, some sort of convertible type of um, either a safe or a note ahead of time before they do a price round. Yeah? Uh, pardon, but I have a question about the previous slide. Sure. Um, I know you stated uh, a little bit about Delaware versus Illinois, but I'm wondering what's the difference uh, when we're talking about uh, incorporated. So the difference between them would be, so there's two ways to look at what the difference is. One of them is, why would you ever pick Delaware? I think is a question. Yeah. Um, and the reason is that the, um, so if you decided you're okay with a corporation, um, most investors will say, I don't understand, I don't know what Illinois law, corporate law is, and none of the, all of the standard investment documents are set up with Delaware law considerations and assumptions in mind. So what, what will happen, I would pretty much never advise forming an Illinois corp, because if you're, you're not getting tax advantages, but you're just making it harder to raise money because investors are going to say, well, I don't really understand what an Illinois corporation is. Unless there's, unless you say, well, it's because I, I have to because of X or Y, but typically what people do is they will incorporate in Delaware and then they'll qualify to do business here. So it's not that you have to have, you don't have to have anybody, anything going on in Delaware, it's just where you formed your entity. Yeah, yeah, I've heard of that. And then as well, uh, aren't there specific tax breaks that they get? Well, it's, just, it's, I don't know if it's a tax break, but the fees, the annual fees, are cheaper in Delaware. Although I know Illinois has been working, I'm not a tax lawyer, but they've been working to modernize their, their franchise tax structure for Illinois corporations. I think some of the considerations that people used to have being a Illinois corporation are no longer in existence. Um, but the, the streamlined nature, for example, during COVID, it was tough to even get to the Illinois Secretary of State, whereas the online filing in Delaware didn't miss a beat. So I think it's just, they, they just do it so much more frequently that there's also a little bit less friction. Okay, great, thank you. Sure, um, good question. I mean, these are the questions because people are just like, I don't understand why would, why would I ever do that? And it's really a course of dealing thing that is dictating it more than, more than anything else. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, Types of financings, so whether, but assuming, um, let's assume you're a Delaware corporation. You could probably do these in an LLC setting, but so can I, show of hands, is it, do people know what a safe is or is it, or not? Is this something people have heard of or not? Okay, if not, I'm gonna just go over it really quickly. So a safe um, is an acronym, a, a simple agreement for future equity. Simple agreement for future equity. So if you think about what that, it's exactly what it is. Um, and it, it grew out of a practice that had existed with respect to convertible notes. So a convertible note is what it sounds like. It is a note, which means that it is debt. It is phrased as you are borrowing money and you promise to pay it back. Like that is what the instrument, legal instrument says in a convertible note. Um, but as its name says, it is also convertible which means that you borrow money, you borrow $100,000 and you say, on maturity date, I agree to pay you $100,000 plus interest back. But if you raise money before the maturity date, instead of me having to pay you back, the note will convert into whatever equity you sell before the, the maturity date. So it is, but it is debt, right? Like if you, if you never raise, so the question is, well, what if I never raise? answers well then you have to pay it back and that's not really what the investor or the company wants like investors really think of it as a pre-funding of equity before the company gets priced 
right? So if you're like, if I'm going to raise it now, the company's worth a million dollars, and I, you know, I got to give away 10% of my company. But if I wait, I take it now. Now that you know, hundred thousand dollars is worth a, a much smaller percent of my company. So it's it's a way to allow people to pre-fund the equity without having to price it. So that's really what that the convertible note was the first instrument that it does still use that was trying to solve that problem, right? So if I have an idea, someone's gonna, but today it's worth nothing. So if I give you hundred thousand dollars, I've now given you my the percent of the company that that would buy is just crazy. So they're like, well, I'll loan you the money. Well, but I want credit for the fact that I invested early. <laughs> so that this is the instrument, the convertible note is the instrument that sort of grew up from that. So it has all the attributes of, of, of debt, but it also can convert. And there's a whole, like my tax partners, like you have to be careful with some of the terms, otherwise they treat it like equity right away as opposed to debt. So there are some things about it that um, you just have to be mindful of. But, you know, for example, we just have a standard form that we use that's very simple and streamlined, and, and again, the point of it is, is to allow a venture investor to get cash into the company sooner before they're ready to price it. Um, but a safe really grew out of some of the deficiencies that I just talked about in the convertible note, which is, no, I don't really want to lend you money. I really just want to <laughs> pre-fund your price round later. So that's why they said, why are you calling it a note? Let's just call it a simple agreement for future equity. So I'm going to give you $100,000 now, and we're going to agree that when it converts, it will it will convert into the um, securities that you're selling, but either at a discount to the price. So if someone's going to pay a dollar a share, so if you hear discount or cap, those things do with the have to do with the price at which the money converts. So if you put the money in on a safe, um, it's going to say that. This will buy the next round equity securities, but at a 15% discount to what they pay. So if they, your new investors pay a dollar, they pay 85 cents a share. And that's really what's meant to give them a benefit of investing earlier when the company's at a higher risk, like raising the price around significantly de-risks the company because it's always possible they don't raise, right? So um, that's why safes and notes almost always like really almost always have some sort of preferred term on the conversion. Sometimes it's just a discount, like I said, if it's 85 cents on the dollar from a price per share. Sometimes it's a cap, which means if you're gonna raise money, my price round, say, say, I'm gonna give you $100,000 in company and give you a $10 million valuation, your safe might say, well, no, I'm gonna convert at a max of $5 million valuation, which means they pay half the price. So it kind of puts a maximum amount at which the company appreciate over time um, and so that those can be very dangerous right in that example um, and we'll walk through some of that later but um, those are those are really in a safe whether it's a capped or uncapped again meaning is there a maximum or I guess a maximum price that the thing will ever convert at or is it just a discount those are the things that are negotiated in the safe those are really an and one way of calculating, but those are the two things in a safe that really get negotiated. In a convertible note, again, because it's debt, there's interest, there's a maturity date, <laughs> there's a bunch of other things that go into it. Um, when, and maybe the last thing I'll just say is that on a change of control, so what happens if the company gets sold while the note or safe is outstanding, right? Like the investors don't want their money back, right? Because of, well, an upside, Right, so the company has really appreciated, and they get an offer to sell it. They they don't want their money back. They would want to convert and sell in the sale of the company if it means they're going to get three x their money instead of just one x back. So the terms that are really negotiated are like what happens if in these if these intervening events happen. What if the company IPOs? What if the company is sold? Um, the safe used to be and still is pretty light on what happens if the company just goes poof. But generally, that means that you don't get your money back. Um, and so people oftentimes just walk away from it. So again, really focus on just the upside as opposed to like having a claim in, in, with what the debt is. But you know, one question we get a lot is, well, or is the convertible note gone by the wayside? If somebody wants to give you a convertible note, should I, you know, is that off market? I think the answer is no. In particular, in this climate, some investors will really want to invest on a convertible note because it is it does have more of a downside structure in it. 
So I would say, like, as an entrepreneur, you have to understand the difference between them and have, your, have a lawyer help you with it, I think, is the main thing if you're not experienced in it. Um, but they're, they're, they're both different ways that are both very commonly used to raise money before you do a price round. Yes? Do you, would you recommend sort of picking one or the other? Is mixing the both just going to make a mess of your cap table? I would not do both. Um, I've had some companies where they've done a safe round and then they have an investor who only go on a note and then they get a note and they come in and, and so that, that's not, it's not fatal by any means because what will happen when you do your price round is that we'll generate a pro forma cap table and it will have all of your different instruments and it will have like, okay, if you're going to raise that 30 million valuation, what does that mean under each of your instruments that you've raised on? So it's not, it's certainly not the end of the world, um, but if you can sort of try and keep, one, one reason to try and keep everything on the same sort of we call it round is that you can do amendments by majority vote as opposed to, and they all convert together, but if you've got one-off instruments, you gotta go find them all when you try and do your price round. So if, if there is a benefit to having one form of safe or one note that goes out, and then, like I said, that, that, that can be controlled by majority investor decision. Um, it also just helps keep it clear in your mind, to be honest. Like, if you're trying to keep track of, oh, there's a much, you know, we had one, I had one client who had 20 safes and two notes, and we were, when we just started working, we are like, well, do you remember you have these notes that have maturity dates? So it was kind of a scramble to then go get an extension of the maturity date, because she had sort of forgotten that she had a couple that have these different attributes, so it's also just sort of nice if you can keep everything <laughs> straight in your mind um, from a consistency perspective, but there's no legal reason they have to do so. Um, well, yeah. so, um, so the safe uh, is safer for the company, in, in summary, because is the, what is the amount that we raise, they will, for example, if the company disappears, what is the responsibility of the company to return the funds compared to the convertible? It seems like a, the convertible, we have to pay whatever this is. And this is our protection, so safer um, is safer for the companies, protect more the companies, and the convertible it, more to the investors? It, it, it depends um, which generation of safe. So there, that was a problem with the early saves. The current ones, I think, say that it's more of a contractual obligation to repay than it is a debt. But in legal speak, all unsecured creditors sit together and you owe them the money back. So I wouldn't think of it that in a downside you don't owe them the money. Um, in, a, you know, in a bankruptcy they would have a claim. So I, I would say it is, that being said, you're not going to have a secured safe where you can get a, you know, investors can say I want to take a security interest in the note, like a mortgage, and they can take a lien against all of your assets. You can do that with a note, you can't do that with a safe. Um, but most convertible notes don't are not secured. I've seen some, um, and it's it's. I think people view them as simpler and easier and faster. But I wouldn't I wouldn't go to the bank on the. I don't have to pay it back if in a downside because they would I think have a claim. I've never had anybody litigate one of these to be honest because usually they're used in either. Typically they do convert in some way, but you know I I think. Um, when I talk to my bankruptcy colleagues about them, they, their view is no, there's certainly a contractual claim to pay them back and a downside. I just was wondering what yeah. the two options, because you know, investors trying to protect themselves, so what op options are the, the options that protect the company? In that case, it's all better, so that's why my question is, yeah. in the two options, which is the option that protects the company better? Yeah, I would say the safe is probably, even again, what does protect mean, right? Um, from an, if you spend less money probably doing a safe round than you do negotiating a convertible note round. The, the documents are more standardized. Um, and I would say that investors feel like a convertible note is safer um, because it is a true debt instrument. So in that sense, I think it, it's, we do find safes being favored by companies for, for all of those reasons, um, but they, people have been messing around with the safes to try and cover off some of those weaknesses, and they've also been adding, like, 
The other thing just to keep in mind is that with each of these, if someone sends you a side letter, <laughs> like the safe is very simple, but then they, you know, they, investors will ask for terms in a side letter that you really have to read carefully because those are, they can have a lot of hooks in them. And so that's sort of how they get around what investors oftentimes would want in terms of pro rata rights and information rights and things like that. So there's also a lot of details in any side letters that investors ever give you. So of course you would all do this, but you should always read and have your lawyers read whatever gets served up with any of these instruments as well because um, people, you know, side letters are common and, and they have a lot of um, terms in them that can be binding and long term for you even post conversion. So, um, but maybe we should keep moving unless there's any other questions on this. Um, so then the last variety of this is a price round. Um, if you've all heard what that means. But that means you're actually selling equity in your company. So someone's gonna buy preferred shares. So if you form a corporation, you're gonna probably own common stock. You buy it up in however many units you want, but like I own 100 of 100 shares. And when, you know, price round means that they come in and buy 50 shares out of 150, right? If you start with 100, you're gonna issue 50 more. So you go, they are, and they're actually buying them. And at the end of the day, they own shares in your company and they get to vote and they have all these rights. And so as a, that's different. The convertible note and safe, they are not shareholders in your company yet. Um, you just have a contractual, either you promise to pay them back or you have a simple agreement to issue them equity in the future. This is, no, they become actual shareholders in your company and they buy preferred stock. And um, the next topic that I want to mention is just really around the dilution of what that means. Right? So instead of you owning 100 out of 100, you now own 100 out of 150, right? Which means that that can be a way where people lose percentage base, you know, to um, control in terms of voting. They, they find themselves below 50% a lot faster than they ever would have thought possible. Or in terms of rights to the return if you sell the company, and what does that mean? You know, where does the money go? Because when you do price around, that $50 takes the first 50, right? The preferred stock gets paid back 100% first before any pennies go to the common. Um, so it's just making sure to understand what that means. It's, it's just a very different style of transaction um, and it means you redo all your documents. And so it's, it's a much um, more involved, complex document package. Um, if you're gonna do that, you'll have a, a lawyer to help you with it for sure. Um, and this is where the, the Delaware form of documents, there's a, a set of documents, if anybody ever says to you, the NVCA, which is the National Venture Capital Association, has published their online. If you're interested, you can read them. They're annotated with footnotes. Um, that's what we tell all of our first-year lawyers to do, is to just go read the forms. They're super helpful in terms of the information that's in there. They won't tell you everything, but that's the, that's the starting point for all really price rounds that happen in a, in a venture in the venture world. Um, so there's a lot to talk about on that front, but I thought what we could talk about um, next is valuation and dilution, capitalization, things like that, because this is one area where sometimes founders will do this before they start talking to the council, because you can understand math, and it should be straightforward, um, but it's not. It's not super hard, but it's just not, not exactly um, straightforward. So pre-money valuation versus post-money valuation. So the really what the pre-money valuation is, is it's just a way of determining how much of the company the investor is going to get. Because there's just it's just a function of um, how much is it worth now, how much money is coming in, what's the total at the end of it, and how do we divide up that total, right? So um, the way that you figure out, so the amount raised divided by the valuation is directly related to their stake in the company. So, um, and this is how you determine price per share. So if you're gonna say, I'm gonna sell shares for a dollar share, you start with what is the company worth and you divide it by the number of shares outstanding. So if my company's worth $100, I have 100 shares outstanding, I'm gonna sell each share for $1 to the new investor. And if he says I'm gonna put $50 in, pre-money is 100, 
post money is 150, right? It's like super simple math, but that's what pre, pre plus money in equals post, if you think about it that way. And the investor is gonna say, well, what they're gonna care about is how much of the company do I own on a post money basis? So that's one key area where even if you might, some, again, you're probably better at math than I am, but I had to sit down and go through it and, and understand where the dilution comes in, in addition to just the new money in, which we'll walk through these next couple things. Because, but the starting premise is always pre plus new money equals post, and then you divide up the pre money value by a number of shares, and that's how you decide what the price is for the new shares. So the price is the same every every in my scenario, very simple scenario. Every, every share is worth a dollar. Yes. There is no secret how many shares company is allowed to issue. Correct. And that's a good question because sometimes people will say, in the public markets especially, so if you're going to IPO, the bankers will say, oh, well, we want to go at 20 bucks a share. And you're like, well, my shares are worth 2,000. So the way you get to that is you just do a stock split, right? There's no, like, the actual dollar that a share is worth. It's just a function of how many ways you split it up, the, the, the value. It doesn't, it doesn't inform at all what the total value is. You can't know. You could have one share in, your, in this scenario, right, or two shares. I, it's $100 worth of value, and I have two shares, so they're each worth 50 bucks, and I just sold one share for $50. That doesn't mean my company's worth more than that other $150 company that has 150 shares, and they're each worth $1. Like, you know what I mean? So sometimes people get fixated on what's the actual price, but that, that's really just a function of what's the value and how many ways have you divided it up when you set your price. And sometimes people, like I said, they artificially change it around to try and get to a price that people can understand. Um, but there's really, especially with public markets, but there, it doesn't really mean anything from a value perspective. You have to know all three parts of the equation in order to really understand, and again, dilution and what percent of the company do I own? Um, so this is like again, I'll just say it again. Pre plus new money equals post and, until it's not. <laughs> and that's what the, the safes and convertible notes that, that you've raised are gonna mess that calculus up. Um, but that's like the starting point for a, a very simple um, situation. So one thing that I would just urge you to do is if you ever get a term sheet that has a pre, Make sure that you are on the same page with the investor as to what the post is. Because sometimes, and we'll go through this, it's not actually pre plus um, money in equals post because you're gonna get diluted by, um, <coughs> excuse me, you're gonna get diluted by <coughs> the convertible notes and the safes that you've already raised. Um, and somebody will tell me if I'm not that, from a timing perspective, because I can get caught where you are. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, but in this scenario, so if you look, there's um, down at the bottom there, it says the pre-money valuation of $10 million. Um, but there's really only 8, 8 million shares outstanding. And again, you include, if you look at the, the pre-financing column, it's 7 million plus 500 plus 500 equals 8 million. And so you have to include your option pool so it's not just your own shares anymore. You can be 100%, but if you have to give equity to someone else, you have to reserve it. So in this scenario, you reserve 500,000 for that. And your investor has said you have to increase your option pool by another 500,000 because I think you're going to issue shares to people you hire after um, after you raise, and I don't want to get diluted by those people, right? I want that built into the price because again, this is the calculus that helps you decide what price per share to choose. So instead of it being just the founder, seven million shares over ten million dollars, it's become eight million. Um, and then, if you look, also included in the pre-money is another option pool increase and my million shares that are converting because I have issued a million dollars of safes. So now instead of it being seven or eight, it's ten. So instead of it being a function of um, 10 over 8, it's 10 over 10, which means my, my price per share is actually a dollar um, in this scenario. And this is this is not a realistic scenario either because the next one is going to show what happens to the dilution from safes or convertible notes that have the discount because 
if you remember, they're not actually going to buy at a dollar. They're going to buy at either 85% of a dollar or at a price that's calculated based on the cap. So here, you know, pre plus post is I'm only raising a million dollars, but my post is 11.5 because I've got I've added other things into my um, capitalization. So. And, and additional money has come in by way of the safes and notes. So this is a just this is like a very basic example of why you have to understand what the post money is. And so if you look at what is the common stock, so that's the founder, he went from 87 and a half to 60.87 percent in this financing, right? He's taking dilution. You take dilution from the new money that comes in. You also take dilution from the option pool that you set aside for your future hires, and you take dilution, at some point you gotta take dilution from the safes and notes that you raised. And this is, this is why, so we'll go to the next example just quickly. So again, this is no discount, which basically never happens. Um, in this one, um, and again, we went from 60.87 to 59.25, so you take a you know, a couple more points of dilution because in here there's a 20% discount on the safe. So that leads to us selling our Series A at a 97 cents a share, which means they're actually buying more shares and then you have to discount that by 20%. That's how many of the safes and the notes get. So that's gone from a million shares to a million, 285, 687. But yours, you stayed at 7 million, of course, so you're increasing the size of the denominator, which is what then causes more dilution to the founder up there at 59.25 versus previously we're at 60.87. And again, the new money gets diluted by it too. They started at eight points. Well, I guess they, they stay about the same, but the, the people who really do better at this are the people in the safe and note conversion category. And then just to, so again, here the price is 77 cents. If you put a cap, that's half, so this example is a $5 million cap. Now they're only paying 44 cents a share. So now they're getting a lot, now they're getting 2.25 instead of 1.28, which means um, now, now the founder's down to 54%. Because, and again, it's all just a function of the price that your convertibles are converting at. And because you build them onto the pre, you actually um, bring down the price of the Series A price per share as well because you, you've increased the number of shares that are in your pre-money capitalization. Um, so you're just taking sort of dilution on dilution um, in the, when you have to factor in the um, conversion discount or cap. Um, so I'll just pause there for a minute, but the, the real reason, and again, what, when we work with clients, and this is why I think, if you remember back to the first slide, preparation is look at a pro forma cap table. This is what we always do, even for companies that have, are just raising a safe or a note. Like, we can't tell you what you're gonna raise your valuation at, but we can say, hypothetically, if you raise at $10 million and you issue these you know, 20 safes with a this percent discount or this cap, plug in your variables, and this is where you're going to be at the end of the day, if, if you think that's what your Series A is going to look like. And that's like a really important and valuable exercise for founders to go through, because it's not really a legal exercise, but it informs everything, right? It's like, it's the core of the deal. How much of the company are you giving away? And that's what price, that's what price is, is how much of the company are you giving away? Um, and when you issue these early stage safes and notes, you just have to, now I'm not saying it's a bad thing. They're putting money in, and, and <laughs> to your point, sir, like, who knows if they're ever gonna get that, right? Like it's a high risk, right? So the, the reason for the cap and the um, discount is to reward risk taking because a lot of times, it, you know, so it's a negotiated thing, right? And, and they may say, well, I've, I've invested and you're not, you're three years away. Why should I pay the price that your investor three years from now is gonna pay? Like that's not fair to me. Of course I, I, I need something, right? So I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying it's something for founders to keep in mind when, and especially if you're gonna issue a lot of these over time, you can be very surprised that that first one with the $2 million cap, <laughs> how much of the company that's gonna represent later on. Um, so that's, 
that's really the point of this. Like, I think we have, you can download on who we go, which I think I, I've got a slide on at the end, and, and work through some of these scenarios if you're really thinking about raising and wanting to understand it. Um, I would just spend some time messing around and, and like looking at these different outcomes because it will really help you in your negotiation understand what, what you think is important and where you want to get to and not be surprised by the amount of dilution that may just be necessary in order for you to get you know funded in the early at early stages. It's you know it's just an, an investment term, right? Their 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 point is I you know we're investing in you and so we're we're not. Sometimes they'll they'll buy common stock very infrequently. Friends and family will, but an institutional investor will always insist on a preference, which the preference just means that they get their money back first in a downside. It's just a market term. Founders always come last. Like that's another thing to keep in mind. It goes. It goes debt, secured debt, unsecured debt, preferred, common. And it's not just common, not just founders that are in the common, right? But the one thing that's different about a venture deal than about a private equity deal is that the VCs would rather be recovering with you as the founder, because they will convert one to one. So at an upside, they would they they they're not gonna get their preference and Get the upside with you, so they're going to convert and hopefully get a hundred x their money, and they'll be at this, they'll be recovering from, with you at the same time. But in a downside, if there's not enough to go around, the idea is they get their money back first. And that's just a, that's just like a market term. Um, so anyway, I'm going to try. I'm assuming I'm kind of running out of time here. So other things, uh, price rounds. They're going to want to probably a board seat. That means you're going to give up some control. You don't do that in a safer note. They're, they're kind of out of your business, usually. Um, on a term sheet, the really only binding term in a term sheet is the no-shop exclusivity and the confidentiality. So if you get a term sheet, all that is just hypothetical and handshake agreed. But the, the two terms that are always going to be binding if you agree to only talk to them for, half, for 30 days or something like that. So those are things to pay attention to. Um, like I was saying, the investor rights that come with a preferred stock, liquidation preference, they get their money back first. Protective provisions means that they have some negative consent, right? Thou shalt not sell the company without my consent. You will not um, issue more shares without my consent. So they have these sort of, you cannot do things without their ability to tell you approve it. And then they're going to want information rights. So you're going to have to give them information and ability to invest in future rounds. Um, so these are these are some things that, that come up in term sheets. Um, the only other to make it go fast, <laughs> I think there I would just say this is sort of reiterating on the importance of preparation, and that's for early stage investors. I think getting prepared. Yes, sorry. I don't know, just some. Oh. Uh, no, for example, for example, the investor right. Um, there is uh, the, also the, the investors can, uh, in some way, in some deal, that they can control and decide them what to uh, sell or, or do whatever the company without the consent of the, of the founder. Could be the reverse. There, or there is any yep. situation that can happen this, and, and this is a red flag for, for companies to attend to this? Or? Yes. So the place where, and this is, this is definitely something that when we work with companies, there's, it's called a drag along provision, is really the provision where if, if your investors are able to tell you that you, everybody has to vote if they approve the sale of the company, is something that's kind of buried in the voting agreement. So there are places where like that type of ability to require the company to be sold. Um, generally speaking, they have more of the negative consent rights that I was talking about, though. Like, if you want to go raise more capital, they probably will have a consent right over you doing that. You increase in the size of your option pool, they probably will want a consent right over that. So there's, and that's like, a, uh, there's a market for what terms they care about and what, what they want to be able to say no to. Um, really, the only thing, unless they, if you've given up control of your board, the main thing that they can sometimes do is compel the company to sell itself. 
in a drag line unless you've negotiated that it requires the consent of the board or the, you know the founders or the common stock too. So that's a term to, that's definitely a term to be to be cognizant of, um, and it, it, it's definitely present in the standard set of documents. The difference between all the different seats at the table? Yeah. Um, th there's, so the, if you think about it, the, the founder is really not, it's just an owner of common stock and probably the CEO and the person on the board and who's been around a lot. The founder is not like a legal term. It's just somebody who used to own all the company and is probably the CEO and still has at least one of the board seats. You can have, yeah, so there can be three co-founders and then that's just, that's how, who owns the common stock. So all those things can be divided up between, between three people or five or 10 or however many um, you can divide it between. Oh, so the lead investor, the lead investor, um, the point there is that you're going to get a term sheet probably from somebody who you view as your lead investor, um, and they're going to set terms. So if you think about how a round comes together, you're going to get a term sheet that will set some terms and there'll be one investor who has written them down and they will say, I will invest 20 million, I'll invest 2 million on a 10 pre, and I expect you to raise at least a million from other investors. So that person is your lead. Um, then other people will may come in, other investors, and buy preferred stock on the same terms as your lead investor. It's not really um, a legal term. They don't get. They're not a finder. They don't. They're not a broker. It's just somebody who sets your terms. So sometimes there's just been some people are sometimes confused about whether that just the same as like founder stock. It's not really anything other than common stock in most scenarios. It's just people think about them in a different way because they're typically attributes of a player in the negotiation. But generally, the, your, your lead investor is just the person who's setting your terms. They don't get paid for that. Um, so I think that that's, the other thing I'll just put out here um, is a plug for our website, Who We Go, which is a, a really wonderful set of resources. We put all of our forms out to the public. You can download them. There's a whole bunch of thought leadership. We update our, there's articles out there. So if you ever, one thing that, you know, if you just put in a search of your term, you're like, I don't know what that means. If you search for it and it comes up on Google Go, there's probably a little article about it. Um, and then we'll link it to other related things. So it's really a, a good place to go if you're trying to learn more about these, about these topics. So thanks everybody for your, for your attention. Uh, it's, been, it's been fun being here with you. Thank you.